Well, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are in this world. And welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, your moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We've got a great webinar on tap with lots of interesting information, and I hope we'll, uh, you guys will get a lot out of it. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you'll be able to access the webinar on demand. We'll be sending out a link in an email after the event that will take you right to the webinar on demand. And we're also taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during the webinar you have a question for any of our panelists, just feel free to use your GoToWebinar control panel and uh, submit your question and we'll hopefully have about 10 or 15 minutes near the end and we'll go through those audience questions. Okay, with that we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, Mastering Machine Learning for Security Professionals, a panel discussion. As I said, I am Charlene O'Hanlon, the moderator. I'm also the uh, managing editor at Security Boulevard. And I have two really great panelists with me today. We have Richard Chetwind, who is product and developer experience at One Login and founder of Litmos and This Data. And we have Vasuda Shivamagi, who's senior data scientist in Rapid7's Octo team. Hey guys, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here. Thanks, great to be here. Excellent, excellent. Well, Richard, I, I, uh, I appreciate you uh, being in New Zealand and it's, uh, what is a Wednesday morning already in Basuda uh, on the uh, on the East Coast, so you're you're on a decent time zone right now. <laughs> so thanks to you both for joining me. Um, as I said before, uh, you know, we've got a really really great conversation uh, on tap, and the conversation is actually being um, hold on, my my computer is being a little. There we go. Um, today's conversation is being. Uh, kind of based on a webinar, I'm sorry, an ebook called Mastering Machine Learning for Security Professionals. And my se screen seems to have frozen. So, uh, Ben, you might want to go ahead and take over. The uh, dreaded PowerPoint has frozen up on me. Um, but uh, let's see. The ebook, which I said is Mastering Machine Learning for Security Professionals is actually uh, available for download at securityboulevard.com. Whoops, oh, it just, sorry about that, guys. Technical difficulties here. Um, we're on slide number three, Ben. Bear with me here for a second, guys. There we go. So as I said, uh, the ebook is available on for download at securityboulevard.com. All of the uh, today's registrants to today's webinar will be receiving a copy uh, via an email link after the event. So uh, take a look in your email for that. Okay, Ben, next slide, please. Okay, so a lot of people think that, you know, machine learning is uh, kind of this evil force that is eventually going to take over the way we uh, the way we think and do uh, our jobs. Um, and indeed, a lot of time, in a lot of cases, it, it kind of is kind of becoming the brains of the the task or, or the job. And in cybersecurity, you know, that's really no different. But we don't, I think for a lot of people that makes them very nervous, um, thinking about exactly how machine learning could actually take over uh, and, uh, and be more than what it's supposed to be. But you know what we want to do with this webinar and and with the ebook is kind of sort the hype from the facts surrounding machine learning, just to kind of use everybody's minds, if nothing else. Um, we're also uh, hoping to explore some new ways that security professionals can use machine learning and in, in how they do their job. Um, and we also want to provide some of that insight that security teams are looking for that you know when they think about machine learning, you know, what does it mean to them, basically? How does it, how is it going to impact their everyday lives? So, um, next slide, please. So, I guess the first thing to, when, when you think about machine learning, you know, you got to understand that it's not like a human, the way a human learns. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not an organic process. Um, you know, those who are in charge of teaching the machines, quote unquote, because they, you know, basically 
the machines have to be fed all the data to and and then it you know kind of learns on its own based on that information so um you know but those who are in in charge of teaching um, the machines have to select the right types of data um, and, and and just feed it in from there the machine processes through the data to uncover the things that humans otherwise might miss on their own. So, um, you know, I guess my first uh, point, uh, a topic point that I'd like to kind of throw out to you guys is, you know, what what do you think is kind of the biggest misnomer when when we think about machine learning and we think about how, um, you know, the, the machines actually do learn and how do you think that's influenced our, our thinking in general when it comes to machine learning and our perceptions? Whoever wants um, to jump in first. I can, I can take a stab. Um, sure. So I think, um, I think one misnomer is that, or, or one kind of misconception is that um, there's just this big, big bridge between how we approach a process you know, now with a, with a more manual or rules driven approach, and then the completely automated, you know, AI vision where we are completely hands off and the machines are kind of making decisions on their own and running things. Um, I think there's a, there's a very natural way to think about the bridge between those two like, very extreme um, um, viewpoints. Um, and the, the one example I like to talk about is with phishing. Um, we've all gotten those emails. We all know how to recognize, you know, if you think you're getting an email from Amazon saying, please log in here, you don't just click on the link, you hover over and look and see, is that an Amazon domain name? Is that expected? Usually you look at the spelling and grammar and there are all these rules you kind of carry in your head for how to find, or how to identify a phishing uh, attempt. Um, that's really a model that we each carry in our head. We, you know, first we look at the domain name, then we look at, are there two or more subdomains? We look at, you know, all sorts of different things. Um, and the, the, the way you translate that into a machine learning approach is you say, well, the more of these attributes we can start considering, the, the, the more precisely we can determine is that a phishing attempt or not. Um, you can, you know, as, as people, we can have maybe two or three of these factors in our head, but then more than that, it starts getting really hard for us to juggle all of these more complicated, you know, different factors in our head and that's where the machine learning approach may come in we give um you know we give an algorithm a lot of data about uh different emails that we've gotten and we teach it to look for those factors that we already know might be really important um and then and then the algorithm may may be able to determine uh different attempts that we couldn't have found but i think the key is that and to to touch the points charlene that you mentioned about you know uh the fear that machine learning is going to take away all our jobs um, I think it's key to bring in domain experts and, and, and security experts into that process. Um, I personally didn't come from a cybersecurity background, so I could design algorithms and features all day long. Um, but if I don't know how to pick the features that you know, people in the industry really know are the telltale signs of phishing, uh, my algorithm won't be very good. So, um, so I think there's a, the, this is a place where um, you really get the, in order to get a powerful tool, you need a machine learning expert, but you also need a, a, a cybersecurity expert um, to give their intuition. And then the trick is to turn that into a, a an automatable process. Okay. Yeah, that kind of dovetails nicely into the a thought that I was, I was sort of had was that, um, you know, there's a lot of focus on the data and the quality of the data that goes in and the amount of data that you need uh, to get results. Um, but just through the projects we've worked on over time, I've found that um, it's really the quality of the question that you're asking as well is really mm -hmm. important. Uh, and so if you don't have that domain expertise, uh, say, uh, then you, you might not be asking, you know, really good questions. And maybe that's where you could say that, uh, in a sense, the machine does act like a human in the sense that if you ask it a really kind of ambiguous question, then you're probably not going to get a really good answer. Um, and if you can be really sort of direct about the types of information that you want to get back or the questions that you have, then you can get some pretty great answers. Um, and sort of we've had a lot more success with that approach over, over time than just sort of feeding a whole bunch of information and then saying, tell me something interesting that I didn't know. 
That's interesting, and that's actually um, a, a great seg to the next slide, um, Ben. If you could please push it forward. Um, the the concept of um, you know the 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 um, uh, the data going in has a you know obviously a huge impact on the quality of the information coming out. Um, ben, is my is my screen frozen or have, can you uh, can you push the slide, please? There we go. So the yeah the idea of garbage in garbage out. You mentioned the data, but but uh, your point about the. Uh, the quality of the, you know, what the questions you're asking, um, it, I would imagine holds equal weight. Um, but, you know, we've always been kind of taught that, you know, you, you, the machine learning is only as good as the quality of the original data on which it's trained. So, um, you know, obviously if it's fed poor data, then it's going to provide poor results. Um, you know, but uh, I guess, you know, we're talking about security here. Uh, you, you really have to consider when we're considering the quality of the data, we're also, we also really need to consider the quality or the security of the data. So um, you want to make sure that uh, the data that's being fed is, is obviously the right data from the right people. You don't want to introduce any sort of vulnerabilities to that data as it's going in. Um, I think that's uh, probably, you know, one of the most important things that you need to keep in mind when you're when you're feeding the machine, if you will. Um, and then also, you know, also to your point again, Richard, you know, make sure that the people that you're using uh, to, to feed that machine is, you know, that they know what they're doing. Basically, they're they are asking the right questions and they are putting in the right data, and it's all relevant and it's going to give you the answers that you're looking for. Um, you know, guys, what, uh, did I miss anything here when we're talking about you know the quality of the data and that whole process? Yeah, I I think um, you know, like I'm uh, more of a kind of engineer and product person, not a, a data scientist at all. Um, but we started out, you know, three or four years ago with this data and our goal was, hey, we're going to take all of this information, um, you know, about login transactions and, and um, sort of activity on the internet. And we're going to try and spot anomalies or bad logins. And, and that was just a, a very naive assumption that we would just send a whole bunch of information and everything we could possibly get. And then we would try these various different um, uh, kind of anomaly detection algorithms and we would get some great results. And, and th that was um, completely wrong. And it, didn't, it only took us a very short amount of time to work out that that, that strategy was never going to work. Mm. Um, and, and so what we ended up doing was actually we said, right, for the next six months, we're not going to do any anything to do with machine learning at all. We're going to go and handcraft, uh, you know, like your traditional set of rules and processes, and we sifted through data and and worked it out ourselves um, until we came up with kind of what we considered a baseline. And then we got the machines back in, working off those same data sets uh, to try and get up to speed with the results we were having um, at a manual approach. And then, uh, and then push it further, uh, so that the machine then was able to take over and start filling the gaps because it wasn't practical for us to continuously, um, you know, work on the, you know, do this by hand. Um, and by doing that, we were able to kind of refine the features that we were looking at and the data that we were looking at as what as to what made sense to a human. Sure, we couldn't, we didn't have the capacity to identify that many features in one go. Um, but we could do it slowly and uh, the machine really just sort of amplified that um, a lot. So I think it helped uh, kind of prove that really the, the quality of the information is really very, very important so, and identifying so, those features. So it almost sounds like you were using machine learning to teach your machine how to learn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess. I mean, it's sort of uh, the novice approach. So yeah. we didn't come up. We, we ended up getting data scientists in, but at, at the very start, it was uh, a bunch of engineers in a room saying, hey, we can have a go at this. So. Well, that's great. 
That's great. So, so to have you, uh, has your organization used machine learning um, in, in any of its uh, processes or uh, projects to uh, kind of either help, help um, produce the outcomes or, uh, you know, in any, in any respect whatsoever? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, so I'm part of the, the data science team um, at Rapid7. And um, part of our, our mandate is as a research uh, team. So what we're trying to do is see um, uh, how to use data science in a couple of different ways. Um, one, like Richard was talking about, is to automate processes that are working really well at a small scale, but in order to make them scalable, we can't, um, can't keep them as manual or real, rules-based as they are uh, currently. So that, that's a great application of machine learning. Um, and then the other one, is uh, I would say really just a, a, a taking large sort of internet scale uh, research data sets that we have and um, asking more open-ended questions about, about them and saying, you know, what can we find here that can be the basis for uh, more targeted studies. Um, and I would absolutely agree. I think garbage in, garbage out is something um, we end up saying almost as a curse to ourselves on a weekly basis. <laughs> uh, data quality is a constant battle. Um, and that's something that uh, I think I didn't get a good enough feel for as I was going through kind of exercises and coursework uh, in, in this area um, where you work with very clean, very nicely behaved data sets. Um, one of the, the interesting and maybe more challenging aspects of the job is just to figure out um, what are the limitations of the data set, right? It won't be, it won't come with a label, but you, as you start playing with it, as you start playing with the different results from, from different um, uh, you know, algorithm uh, attempts that you make, um, you start getting a sense of maybe wh where the holes were or what other fields might have done a better job giving you the picture you wanted to build. Um, so I think playing with the data and, and playing with different approaches, at, especially at the beginning kind of exploratory phase is really important. Um, and I think also asking, asking the right questions is really important and then comparing, okay, given the question that you want to answer, does the data that you have help you answer that question? Um, it's not always the case. So we, we, we start out with an initial data set. We know what question we have in mind, and then it may turn out, you know, we need to go back and ask for something a little bit different or, um, or you know, with a little bit more precision or what have you. Um, but I think going back and forth, uh, playing with the data and kind of seeing how much it helps you further your understanding of the, the question that you had in mind, um, that's a very iterative process as well. So you you both bring up the you know the the quality of the data the quality of the questions. I mean, how long does it take um, you guys on average to kind of get it right, if you know what I mean? When you're you know when you're instituting or implementing machine learning, is there um, you know do, does it take you maybe two or three tries uh, before you get it refined to the point where you're comfortable and you, and you're uh, you're satisfied with the outcomes? I think it it really depends on the on the project, um, and and it really depends on the stakeholder. It it what is good enough is defined by you know whoever is using it. So if you try something um, and maybe your data is separated in uh, in in intervals of days as opposed to hours, and obviously things are averaged out much more over the course of a of an entire day. Uh, if your stakeholder is happy with the results that you get, you you just move on, right? And if uh, if your results aren't looking as good, then we can go back and think, well, maybe maybe we can maybe we can try looking at the data on an hourly basis and seeing if that helps. All right. Go yeah, I agree, you, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, I completely completely agree. It, it, I, I just sort of um, referencing the projects I've worked on. It's it's it, for us. Um, you know, there was really only ever one kind of or a handful of, of main objectives and we could never get good enough at it. So we would just, you know, continuously imp try to improve. Um, okay. So the stakeholder, I guess, would and that and that sense was never going to be happy. Um, there was always going to be room for improvement. And um, I, I, I guess with security as well, that might be the case. Uh, it, I think for 
other situations and maybe you can get to a point where you can kind of tap out and move on but i just with a lot of these things like there especially with anomaly detection and things like that it feels like there are, it, it literally is that's the science part of the the data science and and the, oh. and the bit that i didn't i didn't get at first um but yeah the, it's science you can keep studying it forever um Right. And try and <laughs> continuously improve. So. Okay, okay. All right. Great. So why don't we go ahead and move on to the next slide, uh, Ben? If you don't mind uh, pushing us forward here, um, you know, we also should um, just remind the audience that if you have a question for our panelists, go ahead and use the um, go to webinar control panel, submit your questions, and we'll take some time near the end. Um, so when we look at machine learning in the security context, obviously it's being used for, for security now. Um, and you know, a lot of the current machine learning applications, uh, in, in security are, they're better at dealing with kind of those known threats, um, you know, or, or in predicting new threats. Um, but it, you know, really machine learning can be used for anything that, um, you know, for, for which there's enough data that the machine could actually do the learning uh, or the training and um, and and the, the security folks say, hey, you know, we need help with this. So it's right now we're looking at insider threats. We're looking at malware analysis, network analytics. You guys can read the list here, but are there things that, that you guys have seen maybe um, out there that, uh, you know, as far as in the security space, maybe machine learning currently isn't being applied, but you think it actually might have potential? Um, yeah, I would, I would echo, I think, what Richard has brought up a couple of times. Um, I think anomaly detection is really like the premier use case for machine learning in the cybersecurity space. Uh, which is a little bit different than in under other other settings or other industries. Um, so typically what you see with machine learning is basically it gives you a way to um, extrapolate from, from historical known events. Um, so if you're trying to predict like, like um, let's say power grid failures or certain um, health incidents like a heart attack or a stroke, um, you collect a lot of data about past events and then use, use machine learning to find patterns that maybe wouldn't be be um, easy to spot visually, um, and that works out great because the way that the, the kind of power grid failure we're looking for in the future very closely resembles the the previous ones that have happened in the past, and that's a big difference I think um, with cybersecurity. Right, we we know that that um, the the type of attacks that we're trying to protect ourselves against probably won't look much like um, like like the ones we've seen before. So as soon as we identify what a vector looks like, uh, there are bad actors that are going to change their game immediately. So it doesn't do much good to apply machine learning to really carefully learn what they did before. Um, and and instead, I think where, where it can come in really handy is um, to point out cases that look really unusual. Um, in, in some way or another, and, and the trick is to to make that definition of what unusual looks like um, really well. So I can think of you know like phishing is one, uh, data exfiltration is is a big one, uh, intrusion detection is a big one. So in all of those cases, what we're what we're trying to do is send up a red flag for anything that looks out of the ordinary. So we wouldn't say, hey, this is specifically um, a malicious intrusion detection event. All we would say is it looks really out of whack with with what historically this network has looked like before, and then that gives um, that gives a, a a much smaller kind of targeted set of events for uh, for an expert to to look through. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, Richard, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, not not a whole lot more to add to that really than um, just sort of uh, yeah behavioral sort of behavioral analytics and behavioral profiling particularly for in uh, security like detecting anomalies say for a particular user could be really hard so network kind of traffic and, and things like that maybe is slightly different but when looking at individuals um it it, it gets really hard and so flipping um back to doing actually a little bit more learning around what looks normal for a person uh, mm -hmm. can help as well 
so you kind of you're still looking for those anomalies but you're just using as many features a, as you can to try and build up um, a profile for a person that that helps you then identify um, uh, when there is something out of, out of the ordinary so but yeah you know, on average, when when we're talking about maybe user you know, profiles or user behaviors, how much data do you actually need to create that behavioral profile, if you will, for a particular user? I, my my thought on that would be that it really depends on what what you want to what you want to know about mm -hmm. you know what behavior you're actually looking for because if the behavior is you know what time is this person waking up every morning and what mm -hmm. time are they going to sleep and what time are they having lunch then uh you know the information that you need to to work that out is quite different to say the information that you need to know which is their preferred um device is it an iphone or a desktop or you know um so that it i think it depends how comprehensive you want that profile to be and what you want to get out of it. But in the context of security and detecting, you know, uh, anomalies that might pinpoint, you know, maybe this person's account has been hacked or, or maybe this person is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, actually a bad actor who's hijacked a profile or something like that. You know, I, what what's what's a minimum baseline for to to be able to detect something like that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, go for it. Good, good. Uh, I think I think it it depends on it depends on the particular question that you're trying to answer. Um, so, as an example, I can think of a case where we were we were looking at um, individual assets. Uh, for for sort of you know uh, anomalous behavior on the network, um, and I thought a month's worth of data would would do the job just fine because in that month we could see examples of working days uh, when they were active during working hours and then weekdays when they were completely inactive. And so I thought, great, you 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 we captured four of those weekly cycles in a month. Um, and then when I as I was as I was testing this out on um, on new data. Um, I realized that didn't take into account quarterly spikes because this particular machine was getting, um, you know, it was probably getting scanned on a quarterly basis for a security application. Um, so that was perfectly benign behavior. It just, I hadn't, my data set hadn't gone out far enough to include one of those quarterly events. Um, so it, 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 if that quarterly event was something we were trying to catch, then then we definitely need to include at least three months worth of data. Uh, if it weren't, then you know we could get away with the month. So I think it, it, it depends on what kind of things you're trying to catch as well. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, um, Ben, can you advance the slide, please? Okay, what's next? So this is by far not the end of the webinar, guys. Um, just looking at you know, what machine learning can do today versus what we're kind of expecting the technology to be able to do for cybersecurity in the future. And now and in the future, actually, um, a lot of this stuff is just now kind of getting underway. Um, you know, one of the things that a lot of uh, that, well, some companies are using uh, machine learning for is the social media analysis. You know, like I think everybody's heard about Facebook actually using machine learning to identify um, uh, users who are potentially suicidal. Um, they'll, you know, by the types of posts that uh, that they that they put online. Um, you know, I, 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 apparently there's a very technical term for this. It's called technical detection of harm to self and or others. And, uh, it's something that Facebook is actually, uh, very invested in from, from what I, uh, from what I've read. Um, and it's not just, uh, potentially suicidal people, but it's also, uh, people who have intent to do harm to other folks. Um, you know, obviously, um, prediction of ransomware would be uh, an amazing application for machine learning, uh, especially, um, you know, as, as, we, as we hear more and more about the ransomware threats and how many organizations are being held hostage on a regular basis. Um, you know, we've also got um, ideas of uh, using machine learning for uh, the malware detection uh, and uh, identifying someone who is based on their device location and connection um, to, to create uh, unique digital profiles beyond that personal identifying information. 
um, you know, since things like logging their, their keystrokes, how often they actually, uh, how fast they can type, what are their typing patterns, um, what, uh, how, how, how hard do they hit their keys? Um, you know, that, that kind of this passive biometric information that, uh, that a lot of people, you know, can, everybody's doing it. Um, it's in, and it's what distinguishes one person from another and it's not a fingerprint and it's not an iris scan and it's not a, a simple password. Um, behavioral biometrics as well. Those, those are all things that machine learning can actually take to create this these unique digital profiles uh, of a person and that actually may help us kind of get beyond the the password conundrum if you will that we're all experiencing these days um, you know I, I for one uh, am getting a little tired of having to create new passwords for all my accounts and and uh, being not being able to reuse passwords that's uh, my brain can only hold so many passwords before <laughs> before I start to fall apart. So, um, guys, uh, you know, uh, Vasudo, what, what are, um, what are your thoughts on, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm especially interested in the whole unique digital profile, uh, idea. Um, are there other kind of really unique applications, uh, of machine learning that, that, that possibly we haven't really that I haven't listed here, but have some real potential um, in the security space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of exciting directions that that people are working on right now. Um, and I think what's great about machine learning is that it's it's useful to a lot of different people in a lot of different settings. So you have a lot of um, I would say different communities working on it, and we can we can. Um, we can kind of steal tools as um, people in other industries uh, develop them. Um, so one thing I'm I'm kind of watching is the natural language processing space. Um, and this is kind of related, I guess, to the the first bullet point here, the social media analysis. Um, so there there are a number of groups that are interested in parsing either social media or news media um, content to see if they can um, predict big events that happen or so trending topics on Twitter or, you know, um, political unrest across the world. Um, I think for security, there could be a really valuable um, tool in that, along those lines to predict um, uh, when certain vulnerabilities will be exploited, right, um, before, before they're, they're sort of massively known. Um, these are hard signals to see visually or by hand. Um, but if we could if we could feed those data sets into a machine or into a machine learning algorithm, uh, that might be that might be an earlier uh, 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 alert uh, on on the on that front. That's an interesting yeah. thought. I, I, my kind of opinion or kind of feeling on on a lot of this is that um, you know years ago and when machine learning was kind of really coming out as a, a big buzz. Um, it was like it, there's this kind of holy grail that there'll be some big things that happen that will really change our lives. And that's probably true to a certain extent, but uh, what I feel like really is going to happen now is that um, just about everything you touch and do will have some element of machine learning in it. It will just be really small and mm -hmm. it'll be the combination of a lot of small changes that, um, you know, really, really focused questions really small kind of algorithms that do very one one small job very well and uh, the combination of all of those things will give us an incremental change that we won't really feel uh, like there's been this big kind of breakthrough moment but things are just going to continue to get better uh, and faster and more efficient I kind of I feel like uh, we look at our software we look at the processes we look at the things that we do and there's so many more APIs that provide, you know, smart machine learning kind of off the shelf these days that we can use. Um, there's a lot of data scientists coming through, a lot of smart people. And uh, we kind of will incrementally continue to improve bits of software and, and bits of systems. And, you know, as a whole, uh, everything will get better. But you know, it's not maybe the Big Bang kind of uh, that we might be looking or hoping for. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think um, a lot of what a lot of what we do is a lot of what we try to do. We aspire to you know find the needle in the haystack, right? We we just need uh, so the bad actors just need that one needle to work, and that's really what we're trying to find. Uh, and I think machine learning can be really useful in winnowing down the size of that haystack. Uh, I don't think I, I don't think we're not I, I don't think this field is going to uh, replace the uh, cybersecurity experts. They're the ones who are ultimately going to find those needles. Um, but I think machine learning is really helpful in like uh, filtering out all of all of the the hundreds and thousands of data points that are totally normal or totally expected, and then presenting, let's say, a security expert uh, on an IT team or, or otherwise a much smaller set of things to examine, and then um, and and make them you know make them more efficient at their job. So I have I have two two thoughts that popped in my head. First of all, is that um, kind of user adoption. Um, Richard, you you made a good point about um, adding things incrementally rather than doing like a big bang, and I think that that's going to be key to getting more companies uh, and and more users to uh, to have a certain comfort level with machine machine learning. Because uh, you know I know that. There's always a going to be kind of you know that contingent out there that thinks that machine learning really is trying to take their job or you know is is in the it's 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 not it's not natural so it's you know going to be bad so but I think um, to your point you, you know we've we've been kind of introducing these technologies uh, not uh, you know we, we've been in kind of bits and pieces we've been parsing it out. Uh, to you know, to the point where I don't think a lot of people even notice that these things are happening now, um, and and yeah, I think that that's the way that machine learning is really going to be um, the most widely adopted um, and accepted by the population in general, including security, um, you know, security applications. I think people won't even notice when it happens, and that's a good thing. Um, and then also, Vasuda, to your point, to the people um, having the data scientists who, who ask the right questions, um, you know, is that data scientist, does that person necessarily have to be on staff, or do you actually see kind of a, a whole, um, uh, kind of uh, infrastructure, well, not infrastructure, but population uh, kind of springing up around the idea of a kind of data scientists on demand, if you will, or, or kind of as a managed service or, uh, you know, these the companies that, that will actually do the data science for you. Uh, you, you give them the data and they'll, they'll find the right, they'll find what you're looking for. Um, I, I think there, there, there definitely is that, uh, concept of like the data science consultancy um, mm -hmm. coming up. I my personal take is that uh, it works better when the data scientist is embedded with the subject matter expert um, because then there's much more give and take. The subject matter expert can um, uh, uh, really work with the data scientist to figure out you know um, about the the product adoption, like how how to make output that's actually going to be useful. Um, I think that's a better way to encode the the really great intuition that the subject matter expert already has into the um, way that the data scientist would come up with the right features or, or um, maybe do some better modeling. Um, so I, I I personally find it much more rewarding and, and effective when um, uh, when the two are, are are sort of embedded on a more long term basis. Well, that seems to make the most sense. I mean, if you want to, you know, to to your to yours and Richard's point before is you've got to be asking the right questions and so you've actually got to know the uh, you know, know your market if you will and and know your uh, have an area have a certain level of expertise in your area so um, Richard uh, what what are your thoughts on that the whole idea? Uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree I think and and part of it even maybe a more practical um, kind of way to think about it is is the cost and uh, if you've got a if you're you've got a, a data scientist or a kind of a consultant um, that you're bringing in uh, it's pretty it's well in, in my experience it's quite hard for them to actually just give you a quote on how much this is going to cost to get this particular answer um, 
they they might be able to say, yeah, I given this amount of time, I can give you something, but it might not be the best answer. And the best answer is going to come uh, over time, understanding the, the subject, and then you know going through the science of trying out lots of different algorithms and like working through different skews of data and and you know different time ranges and various different combinations. And and when you start getting into that, then time becomes a factor and you know time is money and and all of those things so for companies getting involved if they did have quite a, a, a challenging project then having someone on staff probably makes more sense than a consultant um, but yeah okay I guess it's a case by case as well yeah yeah okay yeah case by case is you know it, maybe it depends on the uh, the size of the project or the size of the company and uh, but uh, you know, I, I see a market there for consultancies or or, or data science as a managed service. But I, but I do tend to agree that um, in, in that in that respect, uh, something like that maybe um, is best uh, as a as a backup to an on-site data scientist um, who can actually kind of direct or uh, kind of lead a, a team made up of on-site and um, maybe outsourced data scientists to uh, you know to, to to provide some direction um, but uh, uh, I think I think having uh, having that backup I think is going to be even more important as more companies uh, adopt machine learning um, especially in the in the security space Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Then, okay, machine learning, the weaknesses. So obviously, we've been talking about machine learning as this really great tool, but you know, nothing in life is perfect. Um, and uh, a couple things we've talked about before. You know, the first being, you know, that that whole concept of garbage in, garbage out. Success uh, of the the machine learning uh, project is is going to be based um, the quality of the data on the quality of the data and also. As Richard pointed out, and on, on the right, on asking the right questions, um, you know. But but there are also some other things that that companies are kind of doing wrong when it comes to machine learning, and one is adopting it for the wrong reasons. Um, they you know they think it's going to be a panacea to solve other problems, but uh, you know they're not really thinking it through, and and they're they're not you know making they're they're not ensuring that they're asking. The right questions, and that they're um, they're using the technology for the right types of projects. So, um, you know, it, and then there's also the idea that, uh, and it's a very real issue that that machine learning uh, right now does not integrate very well with other systems. And I know that that's going to be changing, um, but that can be a real hindrance to companies. And I think that that's uh, you know. Uh, could could be one of the things that's holding back machine learning for now. But um, uh, Richard, what are some of the other things that you think you know when we're talking about machine learning, folks need, really need to be aware of if they're considering adding a machine learning um, you know technology to their their current projects. Yeah, um, probably. Uh, are you are you looking to use machine learning to add? say a new feature or are you looking to use machine learning to uh, improve an existing feature and if i was going to dip my toes into machine learning i would go and try and uh, improve something that is existing rather than um then do something new and what i mean by that is it might be that you have a a, a simple process that gets run every day by your software and it takes hours to run and it does some sort of calculation or classification of some information. And so that would be a, a candidate that you've, um, you've been doing it for a long time, it takes time. Um, and maybe you could get a, a huge operational gain and a better experience for your customers if you could shorten the time that that process takes. It could be a good, good candidate for machine learning. and. Uh, I'd look at maybe a, a focused project like that um, to get kind of a better understanding of um, of the, the things that are involved. I know when you start out, machine learning as a term can just be kind of mind-boggling, and you think about all these all this data and these answers, but you don't really like um, you, you. I think your data scientists maybe have this when they're just 
they just uh, get this naturally. But for a lot of us, um, it's a harder concept to grasp and, you know, understanding the right types of questions and things to ask is important. So if you start off with something that you know, at least I think that gives you a, a bit of a, a shot at getting it right rather than failing. If you start off with something completely new, new feature, new project and machine learning, everything's new to you, then your chances of failing are probably higher. Hmm. Bashuda, do you have any, uh, Vasuda, do you have any, um, uh, anything you'd like to add to that or, or something altogether yeah. different? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the, um, I think the, the danger point is um, kind of asking, asking questions that are too vague or perhaps um, maybe expecting a little too much. Like uh, uh, I think a, a lot of the times, if you, if you don't know exactly what you want out of machine learning, um, you know the default is well. Let's just see what's in the data. Let's just let's just see what we can what we can find in the data. And I think those are sort of open-ended and never-ending projects. Mm -hmm. um, and it tends to work much better if you have very small, very targeted questions. Um, and like Richard was saying, uh, you already have a baseline to compare that to either either by manual or, or previous approach. Um, and then you can you can vet that out and see uh, is is adding this new approach worth it. Um, it might be worth it, but but maybe it gives you like a one and a half percent improvement, and then you can make the decision: is that worth this extra cost and uh, processing time? Um, so yeah, I think I think having small, very concrete uh, questions that you're trying to answer is is the best way to start. That's a good point. Okay. All right. Doing a quick time check here. We're about uh, 14 minutes at the top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. Um, just a real quick um, key takeaways uh, from our conversation. Um, machines learn based on the data they're fed. Um, that's something I think I, I think I've mentioned that at least 30 times before in this webinar, so <laughs> I don't think we need to go over that again. Um, same with the garbage in, garbage out. Um, but I think probably uh, most important is the fact that uh, machine learning is still in its infancy, so it's uh, we've got a long way to go with the technology. Um, it, I think we've got we've just now reached the point where it's uh, it it's becoming extremely useful for companies, but I think, uh, you know, we, we ain't seen nothing yet basically when it comes to, to machine learning. So I'm uh, personally looking forward to, uh, see what's happening, what happens in the machine learning, uh, in security space. So, um, at this point, I would like to turn it over, uh, to uh, one login to um, to Richard to go ahead and um, uh, give us a little bit of information about your company, and uh, and there you go. There's your screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, so I, I guess one login. We're in the identity and access management space. Um, we we consider ourselves a, a leader in unified access management. And what we mean by that is the ability to have a uh, have a, a kind of a single profile on, online, a single login, and being able to access applications that are uh, operating in the cloud or even operating uh, on premise. And so uh, it's just about kind of uh, bringing your identity together and, and really making it easier and more secure for accessing applications. And getting your work done. Okay, great. Thank you, Richard. Now, Vasuda, um, Ben, can you? Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about Rapid Seven? Uh, yeah. So, Rapid Seven is a cybersecurity company. Um, we have a number of products: uh, Insight VM, Insight IDR, um, AppSec. Um, so, the idea is um, it's a, a number of different products to help you to help different companies secure their own networks and also identify, um, you know, intrusion detection um, uh, events on, on their network. Um, and I'll also make a plug for uh, the office of the CTO, which is, which is where I work. Um, we run a couple of really interesting projects, uh, one called Project Sonar, which basically does a scan of anything that's open on the internet. Um, and these are our data sets that we make publicly available 
um, and we also analyze um, as part of our as part of our research uh, uh, effort to the community. Um, and in addition, we have kind of the opposite of that project Heisenberg, which is a network of honeypots uh, that we put out unadvertised uh, in different clouds across the world. Um, and the idea is to get a sense of what is the opportunistic scanning that's happening. So those are also um, really interesting research projects that we we, we put results out um, um, and make publicly available as well. Okay, great, great, great. All right, um, let's see. Let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, slide. And uh, let's go ahead and open it up for audience questions now. We've gotten some in, but uh, if you have a question for either of our panelists, go ahead and just use the go to webinar control panel and uh, we'll uh, go ahead and dive right on in. Um, the first question has to do with the size of the company. Um, the the uh, audience member asks, is, is machine learning really more appropriate for enterprises or small business, or can it be used for both? And what would be the difference in how, they, how they're used? I, I can have a, a quick go at that one. Well, um, this data was a startup, uh, and it focused on doing kind of anomaly detection and logins. Um, and uh, so I guess you could say that that was a very, very small company uh, getting involved in machine learning. Um, but really, uh, it, the, the technology that we came up with um, is much better applied in a larger company, uh, which is why we ended up joining one login. So uh, I think you can create some of these, these great algorithms and things at a small scale, but it gets really interesting when you uh, then combine them with a company that has a lot more data uh, at their fingertips. Great. Masuda, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Uh, no, I would agree with that. Okay. Great. All right. Our next question. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, technology wise, what type of um, systems and software are necessary to implement machine learning? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say the, the great thing about machine learning right now is that um, there are a lot of there are a lot of open source tools and a lot of free tools, so it doesn't take a lot of uh, startup effort to um, start playing with with these things. Um, I like Python; it's you know publicly available. There are lots of libraries or lots of off-the-shelf um, uh, toolkits that you can get, um, and um, you know we can our, our our kind of exploratory stack is you know Python. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks, that really helps as a, as a collaborative tool to share your results and, and um, code snippets easily with teammates. Um, we use Pandas for, for data analysis. You can, you, know, you can install these things for free. There aren't, there aren't a lot of uh, technical requirements for any of that. Okay, Richard, do you have anything you want to add to that one? Uh, no, I think we started out with a similar set. So. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Next question. Uh, data scientists, um, when we're talking about security uh, specifically, where should the data scientist um, sit in an organization? Should they be part of the security organization or should they be uh, in another area? Hmm. I would, I would yeah. say... Um, it, it, it really depends on the function of the, the data scientist or the project. Um, so if you want to create a new feature within your, your, your product, um, then it really makes sense for the data scientist to work as closely as possible with the product, you know, the engineers and the developers on the product. Um, if what you're doing is, is, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to, um, how to make business decisions um, using data science approaches, then you want that person to be sitting there. Um, if what you're interested in is like very specific security applications, um, then you know you you want some some strong interface between both the security teams and the developer teams. Um, so I, I would really say it, it it really depends on the the function of that project. All right, great, uh, Richard. Any thoughts on that? No, I completely agree. Yeah, okay. as close to the subject matter expert as possible. Okay. All right, great. 
Well, that is, uh, those are all the audience questions that we have. Ben, can you uh, advance the slides? Yeah, okay, great. So um, I, I do wanna thank uh, everybody who, who did send in questions. Um, I would also love to thank our panelists today, Richard and Vasuda. Thank you both for joining me. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the audience for attending. Um, also want to remind the audience that uh, today's event has been recorded, so if you missed any or all of it, you will be able to access it on demand. Look for an email that will have both a link to the webinar as well as a link to the ebook um, that you can download uh, free of charge. And uh, the webinar is actually also going to be living on the Security Boulevard website, so uh, if, uh, if you don't get the link for whatever reason and you want to listen to the webinar again, just go to Security, uh, Security Boulevard, look under the webinar section on demand, and it should be sitting right there waiting for you. Um, again, I would like to thank everybody for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.